In this unit, we're looking at theories of language and cognitive processing. We'll be talking a lot during the semester about uh, verbal and nonverbal communication. But, and we will be focusing on the verbal part first and how we process those verbal messages. The study of language is a long and fascinating one, and we don't have time to go into the history of all of it, but we'll just be touching on some of the more recent theories and, and trying to get a handle on the notion of what verbal coding actually involves. A sign is a stimulus that has meaning for people. You look at the clouds and decide that that's a sign that it's going to be a sunny day or that rain is imminent or that a tornado may develop. That's a sign. Uh, we see verbal signs that say stop, go, enter here, don't enter, and so on, and, and these are stimuli. They have meaning for us. Uh, they may alert us that we're likely to get a, a traffic ticket if we disobey them. Messages are simply signs and groups of signs, but they've been shaped through human thought processes. And as we get on into the persuasion unit later on, we'll see in much more detail how those messages get shaped, the types of effects that they have on people, uh, the things that we may consciously do in order to shape human thought processes. So signs represent objects, events, and conditions other than themselves, and they have two Signs have two functions, and we'll come to that. But signals indicate the presence of an object other than itself, and its time and context bound. A symbol arouses in a person a conception of the object, event, or condition, and is context-free. So when you see the word D-O-G, dog, that's a symbol. It's not the presence of the real object. Uh, but it does arouse a conception in your mind of dog. If you have a dog, you probably visualize your dog. Uh, I see that symbol and think of my neighbor's dogs, of the dogs my children have, so forth. But we don't see the same type of dog. Uh, one may say a dachshund and somebody else sees a German Shepherd and so on. Coding is the process of relating signs to their reference. Every sign refers to something, and that something is referred is referred to as a referent. Anyway, there's a whatever the sign is pointing to, whatever the symbol is generating the conception of, uh, that's the sign, and, and coding is the process that gets all that connected. Cup one. Okay. Uh, in the development of these slides, I've selected certain. Uh, symbols to place on here to, in order to be assigned to you of things that are important, of things that you should be remembering, of what I consider to be focal points within the course. So signs are used to elicit and formulate behavior. Uh, hopefully that's formulating the behavior that you are actually watching these, that you're listening to the lectures, uh, perhaps more than once if it's almost time for an exam. Uh, but I'm trying to formulate behavior on your part that will result in and, and elicit appropriate responses on exams so that you do well. Signs have relationship with other signs. Uh, these many things that I'm talking about, uh, there are words that are familiar to you. There are experiences that should be connecting with you. Uh, it's just all interrelated. If it weren't, we'd be learning, it would be the situation you find yourself in when you're learning a foreign language and you're just starting to learn the names of the objects within that particular language and you don't understand the relationships that the words have to one another. In communication, one's reality is represented both to yourself and to other people with signs. We talk to each other about how we see the world. We describe the world from our point a view, and it's through signs and symbols representing these signs that we're able to do this. The study of signs and verbal coding can be approached in at least three ways.
The three ways that we can approach verbal coding are semantics, how signs relate to things and how we get meaning, and this is, is the focus of what we're doing in this course. Pragmatics, which is, refers to how signs affect or bring about certain human behaviors. Uh, a persuasion class would have more focus on the pragmatic approach of using certain uh, uh, arguments and, and means of presentation. And syntactics, how signs relate to other signs. And we're more likely to find people over in the English department uh, dealing with some of those issues. Language is a structured sequence of speech sounds organized through rules or syntax. If you've studied a foreign language, uh, you know that, that those sequences are not always the same. Uh, in German, for example, I believe the subject is always first or third, and the verb is always or almost always last. It's been a little while since I had that one. But it's a structured sequence of sounds, and it has rules, and it has syntax. It has, and as, as you write your papers for my class, for other classes, uh, you are graded on how you uh, sequence and follow those rules and whether you observe the rules of syntax for the English language. Somehow we learn all of this. As speakers of a language, we have to acquire a knowledge of the grammar. And certainly if you sit down and study a foreign language, then someone explains that to you and explains the rules and you practice and you drill and you approach it differently. But we don't have language classes, per se, for preschoolers. Uh, somehow, infants learn how to use the language. They, they model, they use their parents as models, the people around them as models. But when you start working backwards from that, you know, where, where did the first parents get their language? How did language evolve? How did one language evolve from another language? How did we get a knowledge of grammar to start with? So there's a great debate that goes on uh, between theorists who care about these things of whether language is innate, are you born with the ability to do this, or is language, language a learned behavior? And you can think about that for a minute. Because people must be able to use their knowledge of grammar to create and understand novel sentences. So if everything was was reinforced in Skinnerian, B.F. Skinner fashion, you know, positive, negative reinforcement conditioning. If, if that's how we got language, then how is it that we are able to speak and create novel sentences that we've never thought of before, that we've never spoken before? So there's something going on here. And it's kind of like the uh, chicken-egg dilemma, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, which came first, innate language or learned language? And there's no clear-cut answer to that, but it's worth considering the fact that uh, we did have to learn it all somehow. Uh, well, we acquired it somehow. Maybe we learned it. My best understanding of it is that there are certain elements within the human brain that are intuitive, that are innate, and we are born with certain patternings to those. And then there's the acquired dimension that as, as the child grows through positive reinforcement, through learned behavior, we learn how to use what the brain is capable of doing. In other words, I'm going to cop out and say it's a blended process. And I won't ask you that as a test question. But it's something to think about, and if you have nothing better to do for table conversation, you can discuss it with your friends sometime. Okay, the classical structural linguistics folks ask, how is language structured? What are the syntactical units? What are the relations within the sentence? Uh, this is a study beyond where we can go this semester, and you're probably grateful for that. But there are people who get PhDs and study such things. Uh, the phonologists study sounds sounds in different languages. There are glottal H sounds in, in Arabic 
cultures, for example, that we don't use in English. And I tried to learn to make them once and it didn't work out very pretty, so I won't share that with you here. Um, but, but there are, not all sounds are used in all languages is the point, and, and somehow that evolved as languages morphed and uh, spread and developed through different parts of the world. But anyway, if you're a phonologist, you study the sounds of speech. The sounds of language is probably better. Morphology is the study of words. How do words change over time? What a word meant. Some words drop out of the uh, vocabulary. New words emerge. Uh, take a word like tweeting. What it means today is not what it meant 50 years ago. So morphologists study words and how those words change over time. Syntactics is the study of rules for grammar. And if you go to your School of Communication writing guidelines posted on the Blackboard Learn website, which you better do before you finish your papers, uh, you've got rules for grammar on there because many of us forget those unless we're teachers and it's our job to keep remembering them. Uh, but there are all kinds of syntactic rules about pronoun reference and where prepositions and participles go and what a split infinitive is and all those kinds of things that make up the rules for grammar. And syntactics is the label for that area of study. And then the lexical level refers to the meanings of words and those word combinations. What do words mean? And we might just add on, that as a footnote to the previous slide, the comment on what do words mean. The work of Ogden and Richards with the Triangle of Meaning and the work of Osgood with his semantic space model. All of these have to do with the representational nature of language and how words represent something other than themselves. Okay, the psychological approaches, now we're on this slide. The psychological approaches ask, how is language used? What mental processes are used in speech production and reception? Uh, Skinner took a behavioristic approach and said that and gave us what we've referred to now for many decades as stimulus response theory that the behavioristic approach says that language is conditioned, that it's reinforced, and that it's affected by the use of frequency. Noam Chomsky, on the other hand, is the father of generative grammar, and he said if it's all it doesn't that it doesn't make sense for us to claim that it's simply behavioristic that there's much more going on. And he's concerned with novel sentences, uh, how we are able to, as I mentioned a moment ago, several moments ago now, uh, how we are able to speak unique sentences, to think thoughts we've never thought before, to come up with new ideas. So he's interested in the ideal speaker-listener relationship, and competence and performance are two of the key terms. He's written volumes of work, so we're barely touching the surface here, but but the the critical part for our consideration is how do we account for novel sentences that are spoken if the behavioristic approach were completely accurate. But see, this is a case where the behavioristic theory doesn't account for all of the samples in the population, so we need a, a theory that is, has a broader domain that explains the part that hasn't been explained before. Chomsky said that there